complying with the word of the word of prayer. Would you mind uh, standing as we do so? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, George. I don't think I'll need that one unless I start to become double-tongued. Need two. So, um, <laughs> standing at attention, that's okay. So I'll read chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. And it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he'd finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Well, last week we uh, considered some of the implications of God wishing us to address our prayers to God the Father, with emphasis on the phrase Father, and to direct Him our prayers and, and to address Him directly as Father. We're to have our minds educated from the pages of Scripture, then, as to what God intends by the term, what kind of ideas he wants us to be thinking when we call on him as Father. One of the things we observed was that the term Father, as applied to God, when we see the God the Father having the term Father applied to him in Scripture, both old and new, immediately it signifies a few things. Among them, new identity. That is your identity. Uh, to the Jewish mind in particular, you were supposed to be, uh, your identity was your family. And, and we see that represented in, very often, the nomenclature of your last name. Okay? If, for example, Christianson, or Nicholson, or whatever, all of that is, again, emphasizing son of Nickel, or whatever. Means they're of the of the Donald clan, right? Clan Donald, uh, and and all of that. But it, it has to do with where you get your lineage from. And one of the things that is being emphasized when we call father is that our we have a new identity, a new lineage, and a family. God has become our family identity. Our family was now defined by his adoptive choosing of our siblings for example they become our first loyalty when we're baptized into Christ, Christ affects union with Christ for believers as Hebrews 2.11 tells us, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, that's an amazing verse he's saying the ones that he is sanctifying and the one who are sanctifying both come from now the Father. And that's why he says, I'm, I'm not ashamed. Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren. As we look around this crew here, <clears throat> and, and a, a motley crew it does look to be, indeed, but as we look around, we go, I, I, am I willing to have my identity? Am I willing to have it so that I would be uh, kind of identified with this bunch? And as you look around, you go, I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, but as I get to, as I get to know you, I would love, I, I'd love to be able to be identified with, I don't know if you want to be identified with me, but 
But that's one of the things that happens in the body of Christ is, is that they become your identity. They become the people who are dear to you. As father, he's the head of a family that believers have become in grace a part of. That's why when when people are 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 converted, they're they're talked about becoming in Christ. They have to come now in Christ, and, and that's part of that union with Christ. Well, Father also signifies his roles of, and we looked at protector, defender, redeemer, as provider, as a discipliner, that is a corrector but also as the one who takes delight in us, who loves us, who knows us intimately. And, and his home is our eternal home. That's where home is. When, when he was always talking to the church in Philippi, he said our politics are political. Our citizenship is in the that's, that's what we're all about, is... is that's, that's our home ground, is heaven. This week we had somebody in our congregation who went home to be with the Father, his Father. And going to the Father is going home where we now belong. So there's, a, there's a, a tremendous sense in which that sting of the death has been greatly taken up. We're, we're not wondering where he is and we're not concerned about what's happened to him. He's gone home. He's gone home. But this homey family familiarity may in the heart of us incompletely sanctified sinners be a source of possible irreverence and maybe even proceeding with a sense of contempt. We may gradually slide into treating our Father in Heaven as common or as profane. The elements that should be present in prayer, he includes this next segment that should be fueling our thinking as we come into his presence in prayer. What does this phrase really mean? Many would say this phrase, and they would be thinking of this as a long live the queen sort of statement. Back, I was teaching through the Sermon on the Mount, and I had not been to pay sufficient attention to verb tenses and so forth. And I just came up with, "Oh, this is a, this is the phrase where we we say, how be His name, Your name,' and it, and it just kind of up it's sort of praise time. So start out your time with praise. And, and certainly, there's nothing wrong or objectionable with that. But that's not what this text is saying. So I need you to have it." that with accuracy. So, the term hallowed is the Greek term hagastheto in this context, which comes from that word stock of hagios, holy. There's a whole bunch of words that you're familiar with that are translated variously into the English from the word hagios. It's all from that same word. When, when the angels fly over God, in Isaiah uh, and other places, they cry out, Agios, 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 Holy, Holy, all together, separate, all together, other, and that's a descriptor, that's, that's how you would describe God as holy. When you're looking at it in the noun form, that person, uh, and they, they talk some, about somebody, so the noun form of Agios is translated in your Bible, Saint. So when it talks about the saints of the Lord, it's the hagios of the Lord. And then there's a process by which you are being changed into the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that process by which you are being made hagios, you have in your translations as sanctified. But it's all kind of the same. Hagios, but this one comes from that same word, As it, this term is used grammatically, it can mean 
make something that was formerly common and profane to be special and highly regarded. And, and it is used in that case of us by virtue of the fact that we were uh, very common and that we, there's nothing holy about us, but we were made holy with Christ and we're believers. Our association with him, we were sanctified. That's why it describes Christ as being our sanctification, as our sanctifier. Our, our connection, our, our genuine unity with, with Christ makes us holy. But that's not what's being talked about here. In the second use, uh, of, the, of the word can mean as it does here to safeguard the respect and reverence of something that is already ready. So that's how the word is being used here. But what it is is the word is saying that there needs to be a safeguarding and a protecting of the respect and reverence of something that already is the one named has and the respect that is understand that as the connection of the name. So, this is not a sort of long live the queen clause. This is a request. We're requesting that God would do something for us. God is the one we are expecting to fulfill this request. person, but really short and tight. We're requesting that God would undertake to ensure that the repute of his character be held and maintained to the highest standard. Well, today we're going to try and get our minds around what it means to hallow him by doing a brief study of that which does the very opposite, that which profanes his name. So the opposite of hallowing his name would be profaning him. And so we see in scripture some places where God says this, this, and that, that profanes my name. And, and if we did a, an, an exhaustive study of that, we'd be here all afternoon. And, and I do know that we're not going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few things in the word of God that he describes as profaning his name. If his name is to be hallowed, safeguarded as holy, we must avoid these things and profane, profane his name. But before we get started on that, let's talk about his name. Turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. It's going to become self-evidently, going to be self 
obvious that it was God who did it. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they may say to me, What's his name? That would be that something that they were particularly primed for, because all of the gods of Egypt all had names on them. It was particularly significant to have a handle on that name in order to be able to have any kind of a relationship with that God. What is his name? They may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And, and twice there in that short little section, he uses the Hebrew word Yahweh, Yahweh. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh has sent me to you. God furthermore said, Say to the sons of Israel, the Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So very evidently, God gave this name as a means by which they would begin this relationship with them, and they very much expected to be used that to use that name, and I say that because very frequently in Judaism, it was kind of understood, you never ever pronounce that name, never pronounce that name. We'll get to that in a bit, why they said that. But here he communicates his name. Most things in the universe are given a name by someone who existed before them, like parents, or has a measure of authority over them, again, like parents, or the one who made the thing gets to name it. The point of Adam, for example, naming the animals was in part to assert dominion over them and to communicate that. They were his to name. But no one existed before God or ever exercised control over the name. So what is this thing with the name? Well, this is a self-designated of himself to another. That's the point of the name, and that's why it's important to know it and to, to use it. Turn, if you want to head to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children of the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to those who hate me, and keep my commandments. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Yahweh your God in vain, for the Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. What does that mean? That it kind of correlates, it's in on the idea of hallowed be your name. But he says, here's one of the things I don't want you to do. Don't take my name in vain. Well, apostate Judaism taught that this to mean that the actual name of God was never to be pronounced or spoken at the risk of mispronouncing it. So they said, never, never use that word. In fact, I remember when I was in Calgary, uh, I was uh, looking for a cut-rate gymnasium that I could work out in, and uh, I noticed that there was this one gymnasium that the parking lot was empty every Saturday, and of course it was connected to the Jewish health uh, center, but the, the, the weight room was absolutely empty uh, on Saturday, go figure. Uh, but all the announcements on the wall and so forth, they would say, uh, 
we are here to the glory of G, but they, they wouldn't finish the rest of the word because they were afraid that you'd ever say the word God. Because that's how they had understood that is taking the name of the Lord God in vain. Uh, but the strange thing is that as they were going along, you'd hear them using all kinds of curse language. Uh, God, damn this or that, or oh my, and, and so forth. That was all, but, but in their regular speech or reading scripture, they wouldn't read the name. Well, obviously that was never intended to be the takeaway of this particular commandments. God uh, said, tell them Yahweh and said Moses. And, and it, the, the term Yahweh is used several times in the, in the Ten Commandments. He fully intended his name to be used and to be spoken. What is going on here is we are not to take or appropriate his name to ourselves in an empty or reputation diminishing sort of way. To use his name in confirming an oath that is in fact a lie is to diminish the respect for the name. If you're standing up in court, you're supposed to put your hand on the Bible and you are supposed to swear with your hand on the Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth, so what? So help me God. And then if you stand up there and you lie, very evidently you are taking the name of God in vain. Or you are bringing disgrace on the name of God. You are profaning the name of God. To use his name in jest or as a vulgarity or a crudity is to use it in vain empty, reputation and reverence diminishing way. And that is commonplace in the language of our culture today. And as we shall see, to take or appropriate to ourselves the name and reputation of God, to identify ourselves with Him, and then involve ourselves in sinful disobedience is to profane His name. And that is the opposite of safeguarding its holiness as we are praying for God to do. So, we're going to look at a few examples of how God regards His name to be profane. There are some things that profanes His name. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. Verse 21, you shall not give any of your offspring Profaning the name of uh, your God is the same as this particular thing of idolatry. And he says, I am the Yahweh. Okay, and then he goes on and talks about a number of things, even including homosexuality. He says, those things profane the name of God. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 20. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Also say to the sons of Israel, Any man from the sons of Israel, the alien soldiers in Israel, and if any of his offspring to Moloch, shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will also set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he's given some of his offspring to Moloch, so as to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. So, idolatry, especially idolatry that includes aspects of infanticide, killing babies, was regarded as particularly defaming and profaning of his name. This is especially true if this was done by those who were called by his name. And the children of Israel were called the children of God. something that was uh, 
destroying of the reputation of God amongst the nations. Worshiping something other than God is an affrontery to his dignity and that includes more than just the people who are named by his name. Any idolatry, any place, his name is very evidently being held in less reverence than it should, than is proper, if people are worshiping idols. Is the point. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 19. Back a bit. 19. And verse 12. Oh, verse 11. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. In other words, I don't want you lying, and I don't want you to be saying, no, uh, honest to God, that's the truth, because that is profaning the name of God. In fact, when he gets to the New Testament, God, when Jesus, when he's uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, stop doing that. Stop swearing by him. Stop swearing by him. Just let your testimonies go on and on. And all of that is a false or a lying oath is defaming to the very reputation of God. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 20, please. Numbers chapter 20. the sons of Israel and the whole congregation came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month and the people stayed at Kadesh. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. There was no water for the congregation. They assembled, assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. And instead of just saying, oh, okay, God is our provider, and then ask God for it, they came and they started to hang on like Moses once again. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought uh, the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beast to die here? In other words, they're getting all dramatic about it again. Instead of just asking nicely, they're uh, uh, being quite belligerent toward Moses. Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. In other words, you're saying, look at this, what, what kind of a promised land is this? Well, they all knew, they all knew that this wasn't the promised land. They were in the desert and they're about to go into it, but they're going and saying, oh, look at this, isn't this a cool promised land? So, assembly before the rock and he said to them listen now you rebels shall we that would be him and Aaron, bring forth water out for you out of this rock then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod and the water came forth abundantly and the congregation and their beasts drank and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron because you have not believed me so there is a problem in the belief system there. They weren't taking God at his word. 
ye have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. And the word there, treat me as holy, is our word. That's our word for the idea of you haven't hallowed me. You, you have not taught the people to hallow me. Those were the waters of Meribah because the sons of Israel contended with the Lord and he proved himself holy among them. And we say, well, what is essentially all that talking about? Well, he was supposed to speak to it, but, you know, the time before he took his staff and he, and he hit the rock, why not hit it again? I mean, really, it's just sort of a matter of semantics, surely. But it isn't a matter of semantics because God expects that you're going to do what you're told. And when you do a situation where you're not doing as you're told, and there's another little kind of a loop here, and that is, they say, here we are, we, now we're, are we going to have to, me and Aaron, are we going to have to provide water for you one more time? You can see that the, he had been you know, vexed, he'd been poked a lot, but the real issue is, is that he was claiming responsibility like he's some sort of a magician for the being the one who's going to be providing the water instead of God. So he was really, in effect, taking the credit for what God was doing, and he was saying, I'm going to go do it. And he hit the rock, and he and he did that in, a, in that way. He was communicating to the people, it's actually Aaron and I that are providing you with water, so you know, quit pestering us. And, and God says, all of that is failing to hallow me. You profaned my name. And because of that, of course, he was not able, neither was Aaron, to lead. Let's look at one more. Malachi. say the table of the Lord is to be despised but when you present the blind for sacrifice is it not evil and when you present the lame and sick is it not evil why not offer to your governor would he be pleased with you or would he receive you kindly says the Lord of hosts but now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious with us with such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there was one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. He said, I'd rather you, you shut the building down and quit any of that, because what you're offering to me, your own leaders wouldn't accept from your hand. Will I accept an offering from you? For 
Lord, from the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations and in every place it says it's going to be offered to my name. tiresome it is. They're going, why do we have to keep on doing this? So even as they're offering in substandard offerings, they're going, man, we're getting tired of having to keep on doing this. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so do you bring the offering. Shall I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock. demonstrating our sense of his value with our giving as well. These people were not, and so they were profaning the name of God. Now, the last one that we'll look at is Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. This is an interesting one because have his name not profaned. Ezekiel chapter 36 will make up the passage starting in verse 16. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their way before me was like an uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. In other words, when they were coming in the land, how were they doing so? He says, therefore I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they had shed on the land because they had defiled it with idols. Also I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed through the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. What is it that pollutes the land? What is it produced that pollutes the nation? Child sacrifice pollutes the land. Murder without punishment as dictated by the word of God pollutes the land. God makes that very clear and he says, and if you continue to pollute the land, that group of people I'm going to have to remove off the land. He says, when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. In other words, he had to kick them off the land because of their bad behavior. But then when they were kicked off into other places, the name of the Lord was being profaned. People were going, well, what kind of a God is this that his own people can't be kept in their own land? So the reputation, if you will, of God was suffering. Because God had to discipline them. When those that are called by his name are so disobedient that they need to be publicly chastened of the Lord, the name of the Lord is profaned. to do this rather than allow his people, the nation of Israel, or his children today, to represent themselves and him to a world that are compromised on the holy way. God is far more pleased with having those people uh, be disciplined and, and have the, 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 the corresponding
ending suffering of his reputation because of it. Romans chapter 2, verse 24, it's about the same thing. But, here's a situation. He says, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore, says the house of, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. He says, I'm going to turn this around. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. And I prove myself holy among you in their sight. How's that going to happen? And I will take you from the nations, he says, to that group of people that I disciplined. I'm going to do something. I'm going to take them back out of those nations. I will gather you from all the lands. He's going to kind of spool them all up together. that has the reputation of God in the balance is Israel being kicked off their own land when God says I've given that to them and as an internal inheritance. And so here's what God is saying. He says one of the things I'm going to do for my own namesake is I am going to grab them out of those nations that they've been dispersed from. I'm going to gather them together and I'm going to put them back in their own he had to discipline and kick off the land for his own namesake now he is also promising I'm going to gather them back in I'm going to do more than that I'm going to give them a changed heart I'm going to give them uh, I'm, I'm going to wash them clean and then I'm going to take care of them as a family and be providing for them in an abundant way in their own land all of that is part of me, God says, having my name being hallowed. Because as long as you have God's chosen people off the land, not following God, not having anything to do with God as a nation, there is a, a corresponding suffering of God's reputation. And so he says, I'm going to fix that. So here we have the eschatological, the end times expectation. This is something God is going to do and prepare in order that his name would not be um, brought under continual compromise. And the entire chapters of Isaiah 60 and 62 give a, a, a longer version of that. Anyway, let's gather this all up. This prayer specifically on, on this skeleton outline of how prayer should happen, this one little line, hallowed be thy name. It has implications personally. It has implications corporately. It has implications evangelistically. And it has implications eschatologically. As our Father, God adopts us and places us in a family. 
as God the Son, Jesus represents us and is our new identity. But the problem is, is that for good or ill, a believer represents him to the world. Our behavior is now linked to his name. We can, through disobedience, bring shame on the name of Christ, or through obedience, we can glorify the name of Christ. The prayer, hallowed be thy name, is that having paused and recognized him again as Father, God would now cause his name to be hallowed, reverenced, respected among us as a group, as me as an individual, and through us as a group of those who represent him in the world. What it is, is it's a prayer that our reputation and our, our testimony before the Lord would not bring shame to the Lord our God. In another way, perhaps it's a request that God would safeguard his reputation in such a way that we would not profane his name or cause his name to be profaned in the world. What a great thing to be pausing and thinking as we look at the prayer. And more immediately, perhaps, we're praying that the reputation and the reverence for God's good name would be upheld as we now pray and intercede and request that what we're praying for would not somehow bring defamation to the name of God. This request also has large evangelistic implications. We are praying that others in this world would hallow his name. We are praying that God would cause others who have never done so before to reverence and respect the name, the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We want reverencing God to catch on everywhere, and God the Father is actually the one to ask uh, to have that done. So this has implications when we say hallowed be thy name. This has implications in world missions. We're praying that all over the place God's name would be hallowed. We desire that God would hallow his name through bringing many sons to glory. Father, hallowed be your name. Cause your name to be reverenced in places that it is now ridiculed and scorned. God would safeguard his glory in churches that are called by his name but propagate error and misinformation about the Lord that misrepresent him and we're praying God would you please glorify yourself would you please safeguard your reputation even including in places like that are called by your name churches where things are not going well Follow, Father hallowed be your name and as we're doing so, this is kind of tipping our hand to the next little phrase, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. It's looking forward to something that is frequently spoken of in the word of God. We're praying for a time when the particular people group of Israel would be as a nation reconciled to the Father, born from above. And they would be a credit to his name, and they would be in a position where he can once again fulfill his promises to them as the people in the land. So, a collection of things that profane the name of God, false or lying oaths. And every one of you, because you have been made union with Christ, Taking credit for that which God has done has implications of the reputation of God. What you do with your finances and how you're handling your family finances gives ample evidence to a world looking on, well, really, how serious is this God to them? There's another 
uh, passage we could have looked in in Haggai. He says there's a group of people seems like it just kind of went through your head like like sand. He says, that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you a purse with holes. Because you're not willing to worship me, show your sense of worth for me. to try and blend into other believers, would you consider today becoming more? Become in actuality what you are posturing to be. Become in truth what you're pretending to be. Be a genuine disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pick up today and say, if Jesus is Lord, and he is, that here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start following him and obeying him. I'm going to repent of my sin. I'm going to turn over my life completely to him and ask the Lord, would you please pay that, that blood payment that was made on Calvary? Would that apply to the sin of my life? And now, Lord, I'm going to begin walking with you as master. And stop today a situation where there's a continuation of bringing the name of God and disrepute. Start today in a situation where you are hallowing the name of God of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for the fact that we can behavior individually as a corporate group our, our corporate signature and our testimony that we would pray that you would help us to, to demonstrate our high regard for you and how truthful we are and how generous we are Lord, in 
anticipation of a day when we would in celebration say the whole earth is filled with your glory. We pray, Lord, that there would come a day where the Lord will again serve yourself as master and assert yourself as the high Lord and come and once again happening in our lives and that we would be able to make the adjustments where we would be bringing glory 